As this year's SummerSlam event was in Detroit Rock City, it's got everything you can think of for the build. We got the fast cars, we got Kid Rock, we got Fast and Furious looking graphics on the logos, but when the show actually begins, there's almost none of that. They couldn't even squeeze John Cena's Ford Mustang from 2007. 2013. I feel like Kid Rock is just picking random years of SummerSlam, many of which have no reference to tonight's show. Also, if we're looking back at historic years of SummerSlam, I'm actually shocked that we're completely ignoring 1992, the first time the event was in a stadium, like tonight. Wonder why WWE refuses to talk about the time SummerSlam was all in London at Wembley Stadium. Hey, that looks exactly like the location that hosted WrestleMania 23. Gonna mention that in the build? No? Why not? This is the first time a football stadium has hosted both a WrestleMania and a SummerSlam event. How's that not worth mentioning, but the 1995 SummerSlam is? It is later shown that WWE launches the pyrotechnics from above the stage setup, so why are they not shooting the pyro to begin the show like they always do? This still remains one of the most frustrating reasons to have such a small stage setup for their events. Also, I was at this event, and I looked at the end zone that did not have any fans present and realized something. This stadium, more or less, has the same amount of fans present for SummerSlam as they did for WrestleMania, so they had a perfect spot to build an interesting stage setup. But alas, we're not doing that. Let's just be thankful it's not as bad as Nissan Stadium where 50% of the stadium was blocked off. That was horrible. Over the Detroit Lions. Well, that explains why the place reeked of desperation for success. Oh! Four main events. oh my freaking god. First Backlash had a double main event, the Night of Champions had a triple main event, and now SummerSlam has a quadruple main event. I am now expecting 5 main events by Survivor Series, and every match from both nights of WrestleMania 40 to be the main event. 4 sins for WWE not knowing what a main event is. Logan Paul is here to kick off SummerSlam to ensure that he will be in Dallas, Texas for Jake Paul's fight. I gotta say, he took a major gamble on whether or not he'd make it in time. Spoiler alert, he made it. Give props for his dedication to the WWE and his brother, all in a matter of 3 hours. Considering the audio cutout, I have no choice but to assume Michael Cole said the arrogant, so shithead megastar. No one cares what's trend. Oh wait, new era, new name. I should probably come up with something new. How about no one cares what's Xing? Ricochet's non pyro pyro, and in a football stadium, I'm actually surprised that we still got to resort to non pyro pyro. And, Miss Samantha is wearing and then Ricochet lost all his energy from having to run down the long walkway and turning around. Match has been delayed for another five minutes just to help Ricochet catch his breath. But you can't fool the w bald jokes. And to be honest, I wouldn't be surprised if Logan Paul disses every bald head he sees to the point where he gets challenged to a match where he shaves his own head bald should he lose. Well, that this city hasn't seen since the days of Barry Sand Logan Paul was watching Ricochet the entire time and somehow still got caught in the head scissors when he could have just sidestepped out of the way or locked in an ankle lock or something. Oh, and an L-Bibow! The fuck is an l by bow Since Logan's fiancé is at ringside, and Ricochet's fiancé is the ring announcer, Samantha Irvin, this was a missed opportunity to actually see those two duke it out as a result of one taunting the other. Now, come on, you gotta admit, that'd be kick-ass to see. Logan Paul could leave here with two fiancés. Corey Graves actually believes Samantha is going to leave Ricochet just because Logan Paul wins this match. The fuck is wrong with you? At least I was being funny with the fiancé brawl idea. And this is a smart strategy by Logan Paul starts dancing like Shane McMahon, potentially hinting at his next opponent. That is, if Shane's quads will cooperate. Look at Logan Paul! I can't be the only one that actually forgot that the injured Braun Strowman was Ricochet's partner prior to all this, right? But also, Logan better be careful because that could very well be his next opponent. Well Knowing how much the world hates Hulk Hogan, I'm not surprised that Logan Paul mimics his poses to further infuriate the audience. Heels gotta heal, and I love it. I love the type of heel that knows everyone hates him and does everything in his power to pour more gasoline on the fire, but only in the ring. If he does it outside the ring, then I don't approve. Although I'm putting the sin back because Logan does this a lot throughout the match, and I mean a lot. Don't you have a plane heading for Texas to catch in like 20 minutes? Hogan Paul! Just hearing that parody name Hogan Paul is worth 10 fucking sins because I don't ever want to hear that name combination again. Disgusting. And now Logan Paul looking to rally. Michael Cole was so caught up in the Hogan Paul name that he completely forgot that Ricochet is the one getting back in control of the match. Ricochet clearly feeling the effects of- Okay, so earlier Logan performed Hulk Hogan's moves to be known as Hogan Paul. Does this mean Ricochet is referring to himself as Rocochet? And why does Rocochet actually sound like a kick-ass ring name too? Logan Paul's shoulder is off the canvas for the entirety of the pin, yet the referee chooses to ignore it. Ricochet. Oh my god! 
I get that Ricochet likes to flip as many times as possible, but right here he really should have landed the traditional way of the back body drop because he almost broke his freaking leg there, and if that happened, it would have been his own fault, not Logan's. For anyone that likes to blame wrestler mishaps on the person executing the move, even when it's obvious that it was the injured guy who messed up, you know who you are. Also, Ricochet somehow survived that without injury. Nah, I'm just kidding, why the hell did I make that a sin in my early days as a sinner? Well, holy shit! First, Ricochet landed on his feet, nearly breaking his legs again, on the first Spanish Fly attempt off the apron, and then a picture-perfect Cameron Grimes-like Spanish Fly on the outside floor. I gotta take off three sins for that series of events. Become reality! Oh! Man, with every buckshot lariat that Logan Paul connects on his opponents, I really think it should be renamed the Paul Shot Lariat. If Hangman Adam Page can connect it like that on the outside, then we can go back to that original name. But until then... Of the night! Well done, Logan. You may be the guy who sponsored Prime, but I'm pretty sure that kid would have enjoyed drinking it. Now you drank it and poured the remains all over Ricochet. Ricochet, with a 450. Ricochet connected a standing shooting star press, not a 450 splash. For heaven's sake, he flipped the other way. Logan, second. Ricochet! Logan Paul fucking belongs in the WWE. Whether you like him as a person or you don't, and I don't like him at all as a person, anyone who says he doesn't belong in a wrestling ring is in complete denial. Here are five more sins out for that outstanding and perfectly executed series of moves. But Paul, the jaw! Oh! I'm pretty sure Logan was supposed to land forward first before falling back. Looked a lot like Liv Morgan's version of a codebreaker. Yeah, I get that Logan Paul was a crazy heel, but because this match is so good, having him use brass knucks to help him defeat Ricochet kinda ruins the moment. Hell, he moved out of the way from the 630 splash, so he could have easily just used his own titanium hand to knock Ricochet's lights out and win. His manager giving him brass knucks is just lazy. Ricochet has no idea! Did I seriously just see the referee duck out of the way from a punch that was nowhere near him? That was the dumbest referee never saw the illegal weapon situation ever. Oh, that was a great matchup, but the ending sucked. Hey! You're not the freaking WWE Sutter Michael Cole! Well, shit, he's actually right, but still, that's my line. First of four main events. Obviously, the four main events thing is bullshit, but you mean to tell me that they're not at least putting the four main events as the last four matches of the night just to be remotely accurate with a crap? What it really should say is the saga of unknown origins begins. But damn, I'd be lying if I said I didn't enjoy this promo package. It's one of the most dramatic and well put together in a long time. Here's another sin off. This is number 10. Technically, no, because Brock Lesnar is not competing in the last match of the night. That's the only main event. Everything else is pure fantasy. Why the hell else do the words main event of the evening exist? And why aren't we using that for each of these so-called four main events? Normally, Brock Lesnar walks around the ring like a shark surrounding its prey. But here, he's just circling an empty ring, which kind of makes it awkward. Unless the referee is his prey for tonight. I don't know if WWE is just going through their fetish of reminding us that their events are trending number one in the United States, or if they just want to constantly remind us that Twitter is now known as X. Decide. Brock back tonight, and look at this! Pre-match assault and attacking from behind. Bach Brock Lesnar. Man, Michael Cole is not having a good night so far, is he? Several botches in the first match, and now the start of this one. Hope I don't need a bonus round for the amount of commentary botches. Dot the second rope! What a devastating disaster kick to the air. Warlock and another suplex! I get that endless suplexes are Brock Lesnar's thing in his matches, but this happens way too much in this one. When you first hear that Brock Lesnar's match with Cody Rhodes was nearly 20 minutes long, you think it's impressive for a Brock Lesnar match to go on that long. But then you realize that if you take out the endless suplexes and the many, 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 many times Cody Rhodes is being counted out, you're actually left with a five minute match. What the fuck? Also, I get that we're trying to showcase Cody's resilience, but this entire section of the match is suplex, making it back in before the 10 count, clothesline out of the ring, repeat the second part, thrown out of the ring yet again, and repeat the count out once again. I went to grab popcorn and a beer for Mama Miracle, and they were still doing this when I got back. I think he's done playing games. Michael Cole assumes that Brock Lesnar is done playing games, who then proceeds to continue playing games even after the F5 on the outside of the ring. If I were Brock, I would have fit that F5 on the floor, tossed Cody back into the ring, hit a second F5, and we're done. Brock loses this match because he's being a dumbass who underestimates his opponent. Now the steps come I'm sorry, but fucking what now? How the hell was Cody Rhodes allowed to whack Brock Lesnar in the face with the stairs in full view of the referee and not get himself disqualified? Those are illegal weapons that have gotten others disqualified many, many times over the years, and yet somehow Cody is not getting disqualified? I'm throwing in 100 cents for a bunch of bullshit. Winner of SummerSlam 2023 to bring you WrestleMania 29. 
Brock Lesnar's wardrobe malfunction almost caused him to revert back to wearing his trunks from his first run in WWE. This indeed was a very wholesome moment. You don't often see Brock Lesnar congratulating his opponents after a loss on a big stage, so this was amazing to see. Cody Rhodes is being elevated more and more as time goes on, showing that it indeed would have been too early had he beat Roman Reigns at WrestleMania 39. Yeah, I said it. Get over it. Up next, we got a Slim Jim Battle Royal, and on the business side, it's one of WWE's biggest sponsorships ever. But from a creative standpoint, this Battle Royal was absolutely random and doesn't go anywhere for the winner. The winner doesn't even get a lifetime supply of Slim Jims or anything. WWE couldn't just label one of the matches as a Slim Jim showdown, like the time Rey and Dominic Mysterio fought in a Cinnamon Toast Crunch match at WrestleMania 39. The entire field gets no entrance, while the last few wrestlers get entrances in a Battle Royal cliche. Battle Royal is presented by Before I say skip, this match isn't just sponsored by Slim Jim, it's literally called the Slim Jim Battle Royal, so this advertising is a literal no shit moment. And also skip. Oh my god, why are we doing this? Everyone is in the ring, ready to compete in this random battle royal. But first, let's take a look back at WWE's history of battle royals. That just makes us wonder if the winner is getting a special prize, but they're still not getting squat. Oh, heavy. This match cannot begin! Too late, MVP. The bell was already rung, so the wrestlers can begin the battle royal without the returning Omos competing. Matter of fact, since Omos failed to make his entrance before the bell rang, he's officially not a participant in the match. So, haha. -ha. Also, what is the deal with Omos now? First, he was put in a random match against Seth Rollins at Backlash after zero interactions. He took time away because he got married. Congratulations on that, by the way. And then came back to be in a random battle royal. What is it with Omos and being in existing matches that exist only to exist? Eliminated last man standing. Well, so much for this battle royal not beginning until Omos made his way to the ring, am I right? Even the wrestlers already in the ring don't give a shit about his return. Sad. Talk about the importance of this battle royal here tonight. Sure thing. The importance of this battle royal is Slim Jim Money. And that's it. Thank you all and good night. The officials are looking on there. Oh! Well, welcome back to the main roster, Apollo Crews. You're exactly where you were the last time you were here. I hope to God this doesn't become another annoying factor for future sponsored matches because I can see six Slim Jim logos in this shot. Please don't WrestleMania 38 me again. Oh, don't go with the top gate printed. Champa's bell. And Champa. Yeah, that seems about right. You got Tommaso Champa on an elimination spree, throwing out Shinsuke Nakamura and both Viking Raiders. Seriously, that is actually impressive. Oh, just to have it abruptly end it. That's the clichéest of clichés in battle royals. Just tossed aside. Ah. Uh. All participants team up to eliminate the biggest wrestler in a battle royal cliche. And at this rate, why does Omos agree to compete in these matches after this happens in practically all of them? The stump of a redwood by hand. I was going to be impressed with LA Knight eliminating Bronson Reed single-handedly. However, Bronson climbed over the top rope on his own accord, so he practically eliminated himself here. What a shame. Oh, I get it. This match is WWE saying, sorry we did not book LA Knight for a WrestleMania moment, a Money in the Bank victory, a United States title match, so here's a random Battle Royal win situation. Oh yeah, and also WWE apologizing in advance for not giving LA Knight a lifetime supply of Slim Jims following this victory. You know, I've been waiting for Ronda Rousey to fight Shayna Baszler since the first moment they were in WWE together. And to be honest, I really think they should have just turned this into a no-holds-barred match compared to an MMA fight. Because there's a big problem. You cannot properly script mixed martial arts! I am going to take her reputation. Given how Ronda Rousey's second run in WWE has been, I don't think you'd be taking much from her. Not to mention, why would you want Ronda's reputation if you believe it's like being in a toxic relationship? To never forgive me for what I'm going to do. I wouldn't blame Ronda's daughter. I'd be pissed off too if you gave my mother a lackluster performance in what could very well be her last WWE match. But Rousey's emotions have been all- Aw, you couldn't have given us Shayna Baszler's former entrance theme, even for a one-time deal. You managed to bring back Sami Zayn's music earlier this year. Why not Shayna's too? Rousey, pounded away at Shayna ba Early on, you can easily see these two pulling their punches due to the fact that despite the MMA rules applying, it's still under WWE's rules. Look, I get you don't want anyone in WWE to actually punch each other, but given these two are professional MMA fighters, couldn't you leave off that rule this one time and let them duke it out in a real MMA fight? Here. Oh my god! Alright, I gotta take a sin out because I laughed really hard. Simply because Shayna Baszler connected that kick so effortlessly, yet caused so much damage to Ronda Rousey's face at the same time. That's when you know it was brutal. Likely to be their competitor here. Boy, I gotta toss in another 20 cents because I feel very bad for both Ronda and Shayna. Having to script an MMA fight by pulling the punches makes it look like a bunch of crap. This is basically an MMA fight without the fight part. 
Sleeper applied. Michael Cole somehow doesn't recognize the obvious Kirafuda clutch applied to Shayna Baszler. Right after we saw it less than 30 seconds ago. I recognize it because it's copyright infringement. The Kirafuda locked in. Ronda Seems to be the running pattern for Ronda Rousey's run in WWE. Arrive at the Royal Rumble, win a championship, have a WrestleMania moment, and leave the company following the first pinfall. Or in this case, the first submission. There have technically been about the same number of tickets sold for this event as WrestleMania 23 due to the lack of a giant stage covering up close to half the stadium from 2007. Having been in the stadium myself, the design of the tarp covered seating was nearly identical to that of Mania stage structure. Yet there is somehow 21,000 less people. How the hell does that work? You know what I'm actually shocked about when it comes to Gunther's feud with Drew McIntyre? Drew didn't once bring up the fact that he once pinned him as Walter within three minutes. Bullshit as that was, it's still a fact that Drew owns the rarest pinfall victory over the Intercontinental Champion. Damn it, WWE CGI, stop killing people in the audience. And you almost impaled me too with those CGI swords. Ladies and gentlemen, I am somehow fully healed from that battle royal less than 30 minutes ago. This will not be for the weak of heart. Just like literally every single match in WWE, this one is not for the faint of heart. Unless somehow these two hug it out and select a winner based off a game of rock, paper, scissors. Gargantuan sizing. Corey Graves refers to Drew McIntyre and Gunther as gargantuan wrestlers as if they are somehow the biggest wrestlers he's ever seen. And that is despite seeing Omos less than 30 minutes ago. Why has Gunther been so successful? <laughs> A better question is, why the hell would you ask that when there's nearly five years of footage that literally shows you why Gunther has been so dominant? These commentators are asking the dumbest questions early on here. Took a bit of a hiatus. You know, I actually got a legitimately interesting question here. Gunther has stated that he believes the wrestling mat is a sacred place. One would think that means he prefers always matches to take place inside the ring. So why would he ever attempt to leave the ring under any circumstance if his goal is to ensure the mat remains sacred? I don't know if there is a formula to defeat Gunther. I mean, Drew McIntyre could try a Claymore kick within the first three minutes and that's how he beats Gunther. Worked for him before. As if the 12 Rocket Mortgage logos in the distance weren't enough to satisfy the company, let's add one in the top right corner, put one on the ring post, another one on the LED board at ringside. Ooh, and while we're at it, CGI another fucking logo in the bottom left corner of the screen. Rocket Mortgage, motherfuckers. But Gunther is gonna come at you full force. Holy shit, his poor wife. 59,000. It's hard to tell if Michael Cole is talking about the number of fans in attendance or the amount of Rocket Mortgage logos they placed all over the Ford field. At ringside, and the release German. What? Six foot five, I don't think that's legal. How does that make any sense? A guy is six foot five, so that means it cannot be legal to land on your feet when you leap in the air? I think Corey meant to say that shouldn't be physically possible, but then again, I would have gone on a tirade to debunk that BS too, so I win either way. It's hard to tell if Drew McIntyre kicked out of the pin or if Gunther literally threw him over because he didn't want his match to end like this, the way he held onto Drew's leg. Top. Gunther is addicted to Drew's McIntyre's, and I bet Drew got horrible flashbacks to WrestleMania 26 when he lost his match thanks to that very same situation. You know, I have been enjoying this storyline where Finn Balor has been seeking revenge on Seth Rollins for 7 years, but the one thing that was missing from this is the fact that both these guys seem to have forgotten that it was the demon who conquered Seth at SummerSlam, yet Finn goes into this match as his own man after having failed to win at Money in the Bank. Wouldn't it make more sense for Seth to conquer the demon since that's who beat him? Honestly, one of the more frustrating and inconsistent moments of this feud is Finn Balor being pissed off at Damian Priest for distracting him at Money in the Bank. But instead of ensuring that Damian and the rest of Judgment Day stay behind to not cause another distraction, Finn allows everyone to show up and cause yet another distraction, which in turn causes Finn to lose yet again. This is more Finn's fault when you take time to actually think about it. Nobody in Detroit drove away in fear after a CGI storm suddenly appeared above the forefield along with some Grim Reaper looking figures with weapons. It's all on his own. You'd have to be a moron if you think any of us is falling for the absence of the Judgment Day not becoming a factor later on in the match. I guess Seth Rollins must have been watching Cinderella with Becky Lynch prior to showing up at SummerSlam and got inspired. What have those crazy mice been creating for him? And where's the wicked Judgment Day ripping apart the dress? Over one minute of singing and nothing else. Hell, they couldn't at least do the ring introductions while this was going on. 
It took this long for anyone to actually attack Seth Rollins from behind when he stands around posing up a storm. I guess Seth figured a singing crowd makes him invincible to attacks. He was dead wrong. Heavyweight Championship here tonight. I don't see how that was supposed to hurt Seth Rollins at all considering his arm never moved from the position it was in when Finn Balor threw himself back onto the canvas. No. While Finn Balor works on Seth Rollins' arm, he notices at this very moment that Seth had the words, I slept with your mom, written on his hand, which might explain Finn's confused yet furious reaction. In case you somehow forgot that this match is for the WWE World Heavyweight Championship, here's another one of those in-your-face CGI close-ups of the title. You see it now? Huh? Got your beard! Under the chin! With how much Seth is using both his arms to perfection, I guess the last seven minutes of punishment directed at his arm were meaningless. I was hoping indeed that Finn Balor would execute the buckle bomb into the barricade exactly how Seth Rollins injured him back in 2016. Was gonna remove a sin for the callback, however I remembered that Seth once survived two coup de grasses on the floor outside without so much as breaking a sweat, so a buckle bomb into the barricade was never going to work on him. Disdain, miss By the way, if you hear the crowd cheering and booing at times, it's because WWE once again decided to troll with them by turning off those bright ass spotlights only to shine them back on the audience like a bunch of assholes. Wait a minute. Yes, obviously Damian Priest is showing up with a briefcase. However, Michael Cole says, wait a minute, and the cameras are not even switching to Damian. So those watching at home are likely asking, what the hell are you talking about? Damn it, production team. Honestly, why couldn't Damian Priest just wait until after the match ends before showing up with a briefcase? This exact same situation is what caused Seth Rollins to walk out with the World Heavyweight Championship back at the Money in the Bank event. But instead of coming up with a new strategy, Judgment Day figures they should do the exact same one and hope it doesn't fuck up a second time. Two count kick out. You mean to tell me that the referee didn't hear the obvious punch to the face from the guy who's not a participant in the match and didn't put two and two together? Referees are such idiots, I'm telling you. Balor's gonna win the championship! And because Michael Cole said that, there is no way in hell that Finn Balor is going to win the championship. Judgment Day looks on! Dominic Mysterio probably figured that Seth Rollins was not going to connect the Phoenix Splash as usual and prevented me from saying the cliché. But in doing so, he caused Seth to not connect the Phoenix Splash as usual, so the cliché still applies. Ha <laughs> ha! Finisher moves don't seem to exist anymore in professional wrestling, do they? Plus, this just confirms that Finn isn't going to win the match because Seth kicked out of everything, even with the Judgment Day's interference. That's when it becomes too predictable. Maybe Finn Balor should have listened to Damian Priest when it came to the usage of the briefcase. Earlier, Finn didn't want it, but when he conveniently accepted it, Karma became a bitch. Oh great, because of the C4 advertisement, I presume I gotta prepare myself with the obligatory 10 plus logos. I honestly don't want to go through that stress again, so here are 10 cents to cover it. Ladies and gentlemen, presenting Charlotte Flair in her obligatory championship match because we are obsessed with getting her to 16 championship wins, even though the majority have meant nothing due to lasting a few weeks or less. 14 times! For reasons unknown, WWE continues to ignore the NXT Women's Championship as a championship win while continuously acknowledging every other championship win. When you think about it, Charlotte has already reached the 16 title win goal, so hooray! Now hopefully we can give her meaningful title reigns for once around here. I don't even know what C4 tastes like, but I am obligated to send the commentators for refusing to drink it like I used to for the Mountain Dew, even if I haven't drank any soda for one year straight by now. She is 5-0! Michael Cole brings up Charlotte Flair's undefeated streak at SummerSlam conveniently on the one time that the undefeated streak ends. What an asshole. Why isn't Asuka entering last? If the champion doesn't enter last, they usually enter first. Here Asuka is entering in the middle because... reasons. Stick to tradition, will ya? It actually makes the title look meaningful if the challengers enter first with the champion entering last. WWE, beyond ah! CGI butterflies! Kill them all! Charlotte Flair is allergic to losing. If Charlotte Flair is allergic to losing, then it had to suck for the 14 times she has lost championships, along with multiple other title matches she managed to lose. Maybe the reason she keeps taking time off is because her allergies kick in and she needs time off to recover from the illness. Mystery solved, folks. Oh. And Charlotte Flair breaks it up. Actually, Charlotte didn't do anything, unless we're made to assume Asuka fell back too early before Charlotte could connect with the boot. I personally believe Asuka broke up the pinfall by herself to ensure she doesn't get kicked. ST in the back corner. Forget about trying to win championships, let's just slowly turn ourselves around to begin another staring contest. And honestly, why didn't Bianca Belair simply take advantage? The bell rung, so it's fair game for Bianca to attack from behind, as it'd be Charlotte's own fault for being distracted by the crowd. Very costly! In a Damn, that kick to the air was so devastating it caused Bianca Belair to get hurt without actually getting hit. What kind of scary sorcery is this? 
Asuka and Bianca Belair have been thrown into the corner and are vulnerable to Charlotte's next attack. But that doesn't matter because Charlotte apparently needs her hair and ring gear adjusted, which in turn allows her two opponents to recover. Meanwhile, was the somersault really necessary? That didn't exactly cause the clothesline into the corner to be any more effective compared to Charlotte simply running from one corner to the other. And now Charlotte double match! In the span of 20 seconds, Charlotte allowed her opponents to recover in the corner, did a useless somersault for a soft clothesline in the corner, and then connected a double natural selection with both her opponents landing too early. This match so far has been a lot of what the fuck. Exhaustion beginning to play a factor. It's been only five minutes. If the exhaustion plays a big factor this short length into a match, it really makes me question the endurance of these three women. You can clearly see in this shot that Bianca Belair is watching Charlotte Flair before the latter can even begin climbing to the top rope. I swear, if Bianca doesn't move out of the way, I am going to add another five sins. Bianca Belair did not move out of the way, so I am going to add another five sins. Also, I'm going to throw in another five sins because not only did Bianca not move out of the way from something she was watching for 15 seconds, but Charlotte didn't even hit her. And yet somehow, she did. This match has so many botches and sins. Over. Jesus, Charlotte's knee nearly shattered Asuka's throat with that moonsault. I'm more concerned about Asuka's well-being than I am about Charlotte potentially winning this match. It is possible to aim where you're going to land, just for those who are about to say, Well, I'd like to see you try it. Oh, oh God. I won't lie, Bianca Belair had me legitimately scared for her. She sold the knee injury extremely well in the remaining moments of this match, so I'll take a sin off. See? I'm not heartless. All the time. Risking your career. I get that we want a cool moment where the injured Bianca Belair returns to the ring to stop Charlotte Flair from winning the match, but couldn't Bianca simply slide into the ring and push Charlotte over when the figure eight is locked in, instead of slowly ascending to the top rope where Asuka could tap at any moment? Asuka back up! The misses with a kick! The last 10 seconds of the match was chaotic indeed. Bianca Belair manages to roll up Asuka to win back the women's championship while still trapped in the figure four leg lock by Charlotte Flair, who's been blinded by Asuka's mist. It did surprise me indeed. Io Sky! This is very poetic when you think about it. Last year at SummerSlam, Io Sky debuted on the main roster after we figured she was done with the WWE. She then went on to somewhat dominate with damage control, win the Money in the Bank ladder match in the most creative way possible, and then at this year's SummerSlam, she became the new women's champion. What a year it's been. Let's take off 15 cents. This was 100% well deserved. This was set to be the culmination of a three year long feud between Roman Reigns and Jey Uso, going as far as to label this a tribal combat match, which traditionally means that no blood relative is allowed until battle has concluded. But here, I'm adding in 10 sins because this was poorly executed for a tribal combat match due to having multiple interferences, thus disrespecting the Samoan elders and past chiefs. The real chief, Jey Uso. Honestly, just by hearing Jey Uso proclaim himself as the real tribal chief, it just makes it completely obvious that Jimmy Uso is going to portray him out of pure jealousy. Especially when it was a factor brought up over a month ago that fans somehow, SOMEHOW forgot about. Jey Uso pinned yeah, Uso Roman Uso in a tag Uso team Uso championship match. match. Wait a minute, if Jey Uso pinned Roman Reigns in a tag team championship match at Money in the Bank, then why is he not a champion right now? Are you telling me this whole time the match was secretly for the Universal Championship and Jey actually won it? Or some imaginary tag team titles not held by Sami Zayn and Kevin Owens? What a fucking plot twist. Solo was taken out by Jey Uso last night. I Which will mean absolutely nothing because we already know Solo Sokoa is lurking somewhere ready to strike back. At this point, beatdowns during events prior to pay-per-view matches are meaningless because nobody ever stays down from them. That you earned through tribal combat. Wait a minute, if you earned that by tribal combat, then who the hell did Roman Reigns beat to become the tribal chief in the first place? Couldn't have been Jey Uso because he wasn't even the tribal chief either. Stop making me ask so many questions. This CGI replica of Roman Reigns is probably screaming at the sky because he was banned from entering Ford Field tonight. The bell rings to begin the ring introductions, and there is none. Wait, was that actually the bell to start the match? Jey Uso, attack! Jey Uso, especially if Jey- Not gonna lie, if you combine all of Roman Reigns' title matches where both wrestlers spend the first five or so minutes standing around and doing much of nothing, that'd probably equal up to 24 hours worth of standing and doing much of nothing. Jey Uso has not been in it since the beginning. Normally, you would think that doesn't sound long at all. Unfortunately, this near 40 minute match has already gone on for six. And it's just been Roman Reigns hitting a move, slowly walking around, hitting another punch or kick, slowly walking around again. We're literally just repeating the previous encounters between Roman and Jay, except in New York traffic speed. 
Jay Uso wasting precious time taunting Paul Heyman and threatening to attack Paul Heyman instead of quickly taking out Paul Heyman and resuming his focus on Roman Reigns. How does the rest of the family feel watching this? I thought it was their idea. Those were Jey Uso's words. It was the family and the elders who demanded this match be contested under tribal combat rules. Also, if the elders and the family demanded a tribal combat match, then why isn't there at least some of them present at ringside to ensure the correct rules of tribal combat are enforced or something? Would make things far more entertaining than what we are watching right now. Another freaking minute of Roman Reigns doing absolutely nothing while Jey Uso lays around just waiting for him to do something. Oh yeah, and that reminds me. DO SOMETHING! The kendo stick shots would definitely boost up the momentum of this match. And then you got Paul Heyman annoyingly repeating the words tribal combat at ringside with every swing Roman Reigns takes on Jey Uso. Like, shut up already. His own cousin Roman Reigns! Michael Cole says that as if it's a complete shocker that Jey Uso is beating the crap out of his own cousin with a kendo stick after literal years of feuding. This same camera angle at the Ford Field has been used almost as many times as there are fans in attendance. And I'm talking about the exaggerated number two. Commentator stupidly refers to a roll-up as stealing the victory cliche, and considering Roman Reigns has stole almost every win this year, wouldn't that technically be karma for him? I instantly knew that Jey Uso wasn't going to get the win after the super kick and the Uso splash. Not because the finisher never works the first time, but because there's a table outside the ring that hasn't even been touched yet. That's how you know it's not over. Chair licking. One chair isn't enough, so let's throw in every single chair in existence while also ignoring the table set up outside the ring. It takes almost literally three minutes just for this one table spot to happen. They're really stretching this out to ensure it goes at least 40 minutes, am I right? Don't get me wrong, I like the occasional long match, but don't bore me in between. That move. Roman Reigns is the one who got put through the table, yet he is the first wrestler to stir and get back to his feet. WWE logic. The rules state that nobody is allowed to interfere. Here's another 100 sins because this is just pathetic. This is all legal. But this absolutely lacks respect in the Samoan heritage. So if anything, this situation of Solo Sokoa helping Roman Reigns should cause the elders to revoke Roman status as the tribal chief due to endless amounts of disrespect to the tribe. Hey. Take that. You know, now would have been the perfect time for Solo Sokoa to actually spike Roman Reigns after the months of teases. Sure, we can still have Jimmy Uso do his part by turning on Jay, but imagine how epic it would be for the entire bloodline to be destroyed as a result of Jimmy and Solo turning on their respective members. Shame. With a spear! Copy Reigns infringement. Who the hell? I'm actually shocked that fans worldwide somehow believe this turn doesn't make sense. You can say you didn't like it, but to say Jimmy turning on Jay makes no sense is just plain wrong. The whole deal about Jay going for the championships and being the tribal chief while Jimmy was hurt happened on more than one occasion. The admittance of the jealousy, and then this. I'll remove five sins for the twist of the story. Would have removed more, but it came as a result of Roman winning by interference yet again. Damn it, from day one! Technically from day one-ish. 